Now, uh, thank you so much. Then we now move on to the uh, other important topic. And Sandeep uh, just mentioned that uh, like Sydney and like San Francisco, uh, Mumbai practice is also catching up to these two cities. So Sandeep, tell us. Is my slide visible? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, top tips from experience in trifocal IELTS, a little limited as compared to uh, what we heard from Chandra Bala. I may have uh, implanted about uh, 700 odd uh, trifocals so far, out of which 403 have been panoptics, the lens that we are talking about. Now, we start on a slightly defensive note because unlike Vivity, which does well in all kinds of eyes, you have to be very choosy and picky about trifocals. When these Vivity lenses were not around, we used to implant them quite regularly in all patients who desired some kind of respiratory correction. But there are some issues with trifocals, basically because they split light into three focal points. There is a 12% loss of light, even in the best in class, and therefore it impacts scotopic contrast sensitivity. There is reduced nighttime visual disturbances as compared to other trifocals, but they are not eliminated completely. And one of the main difficulties that patients face is that they have some difficulty in reading in dim light, especially for certain patients with suboptimal ocular health, either due to ocular surface disease or those who have higher order aberrations. However, having said that, there is a distinct set of patients who demand to read without glasses. And the trifocals just fulfills that need because it just gives you that. And not only that, it gives you a continuous range of vision from 40 to 80 centimeters, which helps patients to you know, enjoy most of the tasks that they like doing and where they would like to do these tasks without the aid of glasses. So what is a tip to success with trifocal? I mean, this depends on five factors, and I'm afraid a lot of my talk will be a little repetition of what Samresh spoke so eloquently about. But the goal remains here. You have to select your patients carefully. You have to do an accurate biometry. You have to do a complete thorough workup. You need to give good patient counseling and you need to have a precise surgical execution. Now, the first and most important thing that you must remember with the trifocal is that you have to touch the metropia in both eyes. I do not kind of do a fudge factor like I would do in a pivot because the performance of this lens, which is basically designed to give emetropia for distance, intermediate and near, depends on achieving emetropia for distance. So you need to have excellent biometry, and there are enough papers to show that a residual refractive error can impact the visual performance of this lens. The second most important thing is that you have to address even small quantities of astigmatism. If someone tells me that a patient is only 0.3 diopters of astigmatism, that is not enough. A 0.3 diopter of astigmatism with the rule is probably enough, but a 0.3 diopter of astigmatism against the rule probably needs a management with a toric IR. Need to look at the lids very carefully, as somebody said. It would be very nice if a trifocal patient or a patient opting for a trifocal has lid glands like this. But when someone has something like this or like this, then of course these patients need kind of management. And it can be seen by examples over here. This is a patient who came to us asking for a trifocal IOL, and we looked at the topography. We were not very happy with the astigmatism that was shown here. And you can see on the ocular surface also, there was some hyperemia. And see the result after treatment. And this patient was treated for myoglobin gland dysfunction with clear lubricants and uh, you know, a little bit of corticosteroid for about 10 days. When the patient came six weeks later, the topography was pristine and we were able to assess the astigmatism very completely. So here's where I'd break in when somebody said about putting the drop and getting the improvement. But if you need to take this patient further, and as Dr. Chandrabala said, these patients are not likely to follow up in the future. It's important to give them a break for four to six weeks. You must be able to counsel the patients to wait for that time and get the treatment done. And here is the other eye of another patient, again, who had dry eye disease, was not showing very good myas or the topography axis. And this is the outcome of treatment. Beautiful, against the rule is comparison, classical dumbbells, patient did very well with the trifle. Of course, we would like all our patients to have a kind of a high school prolate cornea with minimal higher order aberrations. But that's not always the case. Sometimes you have an oblate cornea with 
extremely high higher order aberrations, and we have to turn these lenses, uh, these patients away from a trifocal. What is the role of tomographers? The main thing that a tomographer shows is the amount of posterior corneal astigmatism. Here is a case of against the root astigmatism. But if you look at most posterior corneal astigmatism, it's about 0.3 diopters. And 0.3 diopters does very well because that's the assumption by Barrett in most of his formulas. But once in a while, you get a patient with a higher posterior corneal astigmatism or a lower posterior corneal astigmatism. Now, you'd ask me why is this important? This is important because if you know that Barrett normally calculates 0.3, and suppose you have a 0.5 or a 0.7, you may need to switch to a higher uh, grade of the toricity. So T3 could become a T4, or in the reverse, a T3 could become a T2 if you have just 0.1 diastigmatism. Now, all this talk of higher order aberrations and its impact on the visual performance, remember, in those patients who are very keen to get a trifocal, it's very important to look at the pupil size. So this is a patient with a normal size pupil, which is about 5.1 in mesopic conditions. But sometimes you'd get a patient with a mesopic pupil of 3.17. Now, this patient would have very minimal higher order aberrations if you calculate the aberration for this kind of a pupil. And so a patient who may seem undesirable otherwise for a trifocal can suddenly be a good candidate for a trifocal. Or a patient like this who has a higher than a six millimeter pupil, and this is a condition where a mesopic pupil may not be the best candidate if those higher order aberrations are already measured by your measuring devices. Again, as somebody said, the OCT plays an important role, not to pick out cases like this, which is a very manifest ERN, and which could be picked up even on the clinical examination. But a subtle finding, such as a patient who has got a pressure of 18, and when you do his OCT, don't only do his macula, look at his discs also. You might find a little bit of thinning or par and fell in the inferior quadrant. Do his field and you'll find that the patient already has early glaucoma. You could miss this out. Or a subtle diabetic macular regime, or a patient who has got a very small macular hole. Now these are cases which can easily, as some very easily said, uh, very eloquently spoke about that they can be easily missed out by even the retinal specialist. So when it comes to patient selection, the most important uh, person out here is the patient himself. Typically in any practice, you have about 20 to 30 percent of patients who may be opting for a multifocal IRF. Now those who are motivated with realistic expectations are probably the ideal patients. But those who are motivated with very high expectations may not be the ideal patient, but it's a challenging patient. I like to take care of these patients because these are patients who refer me more patients. And of course, patients who are motivated, but they have unrealistic expectations or coexisting ocular pathologies, you need to shift them over to a toric or a monofocal eye. So who are the patients who might select for my trifocals? These are patients who no longer desire to wear glasses because of their age and because of their functional and ocular uh, requirements. These should be patients who expect good unaided near vision. They should be alert to the possibility that they need to get a bilateral implant done. And that's one important point I'd like to make out that all trifocal patients should be counseled for early second implant. I normally don't like to keep a gap of more than three months, but of course, it varies from practice to practice. So who are the ideal patients? Those who are desirous of spectacle independence, especially for reading. Those who have got normalized except for cataract, and this is where I'd say that all my pre-lex patients, those patients who don't have significant cataract, are not good candidates, I've realized, for a trifocal. They're probably better off with the baby. Having said that, doesn't mean there would be occasionally a patient who demands to uh, read without glasses. He needs to be counseled about the loss of contrast. And if he's still good enough uh, and willing to accept that, you can put in a trifocal. These patients should have regular or no astigmatism. I need to have an accurate biometry. I feel uncomfortable if my patient I'm not able to assess on an optical biometry because of a mature or hypermature cataract. These patients should have a good pristine topography with no previous refractive surgery, minimal higher order aberrations. They should be willing to tolerate uh, some halos and a mild glare and willing for bilateral implantations. These are patients who are not so good candidates. Those who are demanding patients, those who are fearsome of reported nighttime visual disturbances, who are night drivers by profession, or who work in dimly lit environments. Be careful in patients who have significant dry eye disease and ocular surface disease, patients who are low myopes. These are patients who always had good vision without glasses and are unwilling to accept the fact 
that they need better light in order to read fine print. Patients who are hematopic and who do not have significant cataract. Remember, all patients typically would like to achieve hematopia for all distances, distance, intermediate, and near, and without nighttime visual disturbance. But it's not possible to satisfy all, and we need to explain to this patient because sometimes, once in a way, this patient may turn around and say, after having implanted, do I still need to wear glasses? Okay, so you must be able to assess your patient. You must be able to judge your patient. I assess the patient from the moment he walks into my clinic, from the way he walks, whether he's wearing glasses, what's the thickness of his glasses, how he speaks, how he dresses, how he's, I mean, you need to smell the trifocal. You need to be able to tell that this patient is a good candidate because a lot ultimately depends upon the personality. We have to match their expectations. Sometimes we have to modify their expectations, but in the end, we should be able to give them what they want or what the lens can perform. Remember, the lens is an art piece of physics, so it's going to behave the same every time on the optical bench, but each eye is different. And therefore, the visual performance in a certain eye with a certain pupil size could be different. So you cannot say that this lens of this company is better than this. This lens in which eye is what is important. The most important thing in all these cases is counseling the patient. You need to document in the clinical chart what you tell the patient, Counsel them about the visual disturbances. Counsel them about the reading distance. Tell them it takes full time. It takes time for full adaptation. Don't ever promise that you will not wear glasses again. And remember, of course, as Dr. Vasavra said, these people are paying out of the pocket. So obviously they expect much more. And so we need to modify their expectations. There's not much in surgical pearls because ultimately all of us are good cataract surgeons. All that we need to do is put the lens in safely. Remember, if possible, align the optical center along the visual axis and do not implant the trifocal in case of zonal or integrity or significant vitreous loss. Uh, one small little thing over here, when you're doing your optical biometer, just have a look at your angle kappa, your x is 0.4. And if possible, you can try and align the optical center. Remember, the lens centers in the back depending on the direction of the apple. So when you're looking at angle kappa, which is the horizontal meridian, it does well for patients who are getting a non toric trifocal or patients who are with the rule estimates. Because this lens, you can nudge in this direction or in this direction. However, in cases of uh, patients with, uh, with uh, against the rule estimates, it is not possible to do so. So what is the impact on our practice? We are now more confident than ever before while offering female refractive cataract surgery to our patients. Approximately 20 to 25% of our patients are now opting for breast biopsy correction IOLs. By communicating clearly and openly with our patients, we are now able to retain their loyalty and adherence despite being asked to wait to ensure fitness of the ocular surface prior to surgery. Patients pre counseled about expected visual outcomes are now the best ambassadors for our services. So the most important thing is that after all these years, we have earned the faith of our patients. It is important for us to keep that faith. Be open, tell the patients what to expect. And I think if you follow these simple pearls, you will have a successful first pair in your life. Thank you so much. Excellent.